content today. We're going to continue. This is the last part of our generous series. This is part four. And so we're going to, you're going to see a lot of the same verses that we've been talking about all throughout this series, and we've been talking about being generous. So we're going to see a lot of the same verses today. And so we're going to get started. We're going to jump right in here. If you got your message notes with you, you can follow along. It's, a, it's an excellent way. As a matter of fact, I've kind of done something, set something up uh, today to kind of maybe give you a little room to put in some of your thoughts and maybe try to help you develop uh, an area maybe that you want to be more generous in. And you can write down some of your own ideas because the idea is, is that you fill out this this, the message notes and you take it home and somehow it ends up on your kitchen counter and some way or through the middle of your week you're like, oh yeah, and you pick it up and you, you read it and you remind yourself of, of the things that we've been talking about throughout this whole series, amen? So we're going to start today in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we've talked about this passage several times throughout this. And I think it's important to always visit this passage and always kind of bring this back to the forefront. God doesn't want to pressure you into giving. He don't want you to be, uh, you know, he don't want you to give because you feel like you have to. You know what I'm saying? God don't want you to be a have-to giver. Well, I have to give because it's what I've been taught by you know this person or that person that this is what I have to do. God don't want you to have to do anything. He wants you to do it because you get to do it. You know what I'm saying? Because of the life that we have now, because of what Jesus done, He brought us out from under a covenant that says you have to do things this way and brought us into a covenant that says you get to do things this way. You know, I get to be generous. I get to love people because of the love that was given to me. I get to be generous with my money because of the generosity that God has poured out on me. I get to be generous with my talents because why? God has blessed me with talents in different areas. You know, and we talked about this a little bit last week. Each one of you has a purpose. God has a specific purpose for you. And if you're not fulfilling that purpose, guess what? Nobody else can fulfill it. So it's not going to get fulfilled until you begin to step out in your purpose. Amen? You do things, you, you are generous with your time and all of those things because, you, uh, because God loves a cheerful giver. He loves it when you cheerfully give. And then 2 Corinthians 9, 11, a few verses later, it says this. It says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be what? Generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. It says that you'll be blessed. God will give you certain abilities. God will give you certain talents. He will give you certain, you know, depending on where you are, He will bless you financially. He gives you all of these things so that on every occasion, every time God presents an opportunity to you, you can be generous. Whether it's with your time, your finances, your talents and abilities. You hear what I'm saying? Because everybody has something that they can offer. It's a matter of looking at yourself through the lens of what God has done for you. Amen? Not looking through the lens of what I can't do, or you know what I'm saying, all of those things. You have to, you have to look through the lens of, of, of Jesus, really. You have to look through the lens of Jesus. What He has done for me causes me to want to be generous to other people. Amen? Somebody's going to have to get y'all some coffee or something. Today we want to today at the first part I want to talk here I got three three little points here and I want to talk about this what is my plan for uh, what is my plan for generosity what's your plan for generosity do you have a plan for generosity you know we've been talking about being generous have you maybe developed a plan for generosity have have has anybody been generous this week I know of, I know of a couple of people in this room I've seen some stuff happen this week that I thought was just awesome and I want to tell you something, and because I was able to personally be involved in this situation, and, and I kind of knew what was going on, I want to tell you that when this one person was generous and gave something to this other person that wasn't expecting it, how have you know it changed their whole day? Because I got phone calls, 
And, and they were just couldn't believe it. They were amazed. They were like, oh my Lord, I just never would have, I just, I just didn't expect it. You know, I was so surprised and so excited. So your generosity can change somebody's day. I want you to know that. I want you to know. That, and then, you know what? And, it, and, and, and what was done wasn't like, I mean, it, you know, like they didn't spend thousands of dollars. It was the thought that somebody thought enough about me to take time out of their day to invest into me. That alone will change your day knowing that, you know what I mean? It's irrelevant, it's irrelevant that it was chocolate-covered strawberries and stuff like that. I'm sure that was awesome. But the, but the fact that you know that somebody thought about you and they wanted to be generous and give you something, that changed the day of that person. So I want you to understand generosity is important and you need to have a plan for it. What are some things that you can do? The first one we want to talk about is and because what we're talking about is intentional generosity. That's what we're talking about, being intentional with our generosity. And the first thing we want to talk about here is I will intentionally share my resources. I will intentionally share my resources. And I've left you some blanks there up underneath that. And what, what I want you to do with that is, is I want you to begin to write down what are some things you can do. What are some ways that you can share your resources? What can I do this week? What's my plan for generosity? What can I do this week to share my resources with somebody else? You know, write some ideas down there. If you don't have none right now, take it home with you and think about, hey, how can, how can I be maybe a little more generous this week? Let me develop a plan for being generous. You know, because ultimately, what do we want to do? We want to touch people's lives. We want to reach into their life, into their, you know, because a lot of people right now are just, I mean, their life is a whirlwind and they sometimes feel like they're just in a mess. And what we want to do is, is we want to be the hand that reaches in the mess and says, you're not alone. That's what we want to do. We don't want to be those people that stand on the, on the sideline and say, we're going to wait till your mess settles out because I don't want to get any of your mess on me. Amen. We don't want to be that. I don't want to get any of your mess. We don't want to be like that because, you know, it's like I've said before in the Old Testament and under this old covenant, you were to stay away from people who had, you know, uh, like a leper. You know, you, would, you were told to stay away from those people because what they had would get on you and, it would, and you would end up with leprosy. So you were told to stay away from people like that. And you know what I believe? I believe that a lot of the church today is still telling its people that you need to stay away from people like this. Because if you get close to people like that, then you're going to get it on you. And you don't want to be stained with the sin of the world. It's a bunch of garbage. Because what it is, it's a lack of understanding in which covenant you operate from. Because the covenant that you now operate from, Jesus, God Himself, and the Holy Spirit have said, I have come to make my abode in you. I've come to live in you. And now everything that, what does it say? Everything that you touch will prosper. Because now I understand that the living God is in me and I operate in this covenant that says you've got some mess around you and I've got something in me that can cure and fix your mess. I'm not worried about getting your mess on me. I'm worried about getting what's in me on you. You hear what I'm saying? So we need to, we need to be people who are generous. And see, and what I'm saying is, is this is all part of being generous. Because guess what? There has to be a willingness there to say that I'm going to step into your mess. I'm going to reach into your mess. I'm going to reach into whatever is going on in your life. And I'm going I'm to try to be an anchor for you. I'm going to try to help you. I'm going to try to get what God has given me, the wisdom and the truths and the revelation, all the things He's given me. I want to try to reach into your life and give those to you. Because what I have, the Lord has given me, and it can help you. Amen? So I want to encourage you, don't be a people who, stays, who stay away from, from other people who are going through a mess or maybe who look like their life is a mess. Don't stay away from those people. Get in there. Step in there. Be generous with what God has given you. Because you know what? Some of you have certain talents and abilities where you're able to reach and you're able to talk and do things that, that other people may not be talented in. You may be an excellent speaker. 
You may be somebody who's, who's very good at, hey, a, a comforter. Somebody who knows how to comfort people when they're hurting. Amen? Each one of you has an ability, and some of you have multiple abilities. So I want to encourage you, be generous with the abilities that God has given you. Don't hold back. Look at your neighbor and say, don't hold back. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Be generous. The second one, I will intentionally share. This is an important one. I will intentionally share my time. I will intentionally share my time. What are some things you can do this week? Who are some people that you can intentionally share your time with this week? You can write down a couple of names. You can write down as many names as you want to. You can write down as many situations that you need to invest your time in. But I'm telling you, you know, I believe that it, it, when I talk about investing time, I believe this is important. I believe it's more important than investing money. I believe investing time changes lives. While money, uh, while I believe that investing money is important, I believe it is investing time that, that, that ultimately changes people's lives. I believe that's where the context of life change happens is when you begin to invest time into somebody else. Have you ever invested a lot of time into, into someone else and, and watched their life change? And then when you got to the end of it and you saw this person who maybe was far away from God and you begin to invest time into them and then you watched them make all these steps and then now when you look at them, you see them and they're just so on fire for God and you can step back and say, that is an excellent return on my investment of time, right? Isn't that not an excellent return when you see people go through this journey or you see people come out of, of, of bondage and out of the things that they were captive to? That's an excellent investment of your time. And I promise when you invest your time properly into people, you know, the Lord says that when His Word goes forth, it does not return void. It does not return empty. That means when you go forth and you invest into people the word that God has invested in you, it's going to bring back a return. Amen? How will I intentionally share my time? Let's think of a plan. Let's think of something. Let's think of a way that we can intentionally share our time this week. And lastly, this is an important one, and this is kind of a challenging, a challenging one because, you know, we have a lot of opportunities to do this, and I think a lot of times we don't do it because we're so afraid of what somebody might say or what somebody might think because of the world we've lived, we live in now. It's kind of almost made this a subject where people are afraid to say something because of how somebody else may respond. Amen? The last one is this. I will find a way this week. I will intentionally share Christ. I will find a way to intentionally Share Christ this week. Be intentional about sharing Christ with somebody. And I say that because anybody knows the way the workplaces are, the way our school systems are, the way everything is now, they make it very difficult to do this last one these days. Because, I, you know, you're always worried about what somebody's going to say or what somebody's going to do and making somebody uncomfortable, this, that, and the other. Be intentional about sharing Christ. I'm not saying just bust up in a restaurant and, and just start, you know, letting loose. I'm saying be intentional. Pick, find somebody that you know that needs Christ. Be intentional about sharing the grace of God and the love of Jesus with somebody. I can think of several people. I have a list of people that I constantly keep on my mind that I'm constantly trying to reach, but I don't push them. I'm intentional about how I approach it. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to be a burden to somebody. I don't want to overburden somebody. You know those people that say all you do is run around and try to shove the Bible down their throat. I don't try to be that way. I try to express a friendship, a relationship. I try to express the love that's been expressed to me towards them. Amen? Because I believe, like I said, I'm investing my time in them. And when the opportunity is right, when the door is open, I can intentionally share Christ. Amen? You got to be you got to be intentional about it because God will open up a door. He will create an opportunity for you to be able to share Christ. I've told you all the story about the guy that that uh, had also had a list of people that he constantly kept on his mind and how one of them was an atheist. You remember me telling you that story and about how, you know, he he told him he said, "Hey, I want to talk about the historical Jesus, but I don't want to I don't want to talk about the Bible, but I just want to talk about the historical Jesus." You know, and he was like, okay, we'll talk about the historical Jesus. I don't know how we're going to do it without the Bible, but we'll talk about him. 
You know, and the whole, and it ended up getting down to why this guy didn't believe in God was because somebody had told him a lie. They had said, they told him that, that God sends people to hell. And his thing was, he said, well, I tell you, I wouldn't believe in a God that sends people to hell either. I don't blame you. He said, but since we're here, do you mind if I share with you the real God? Will you mind if I share with you my God? And he began to tell him, he began to intentionally share Christ with him because he said, look, he said, Christ came and died for you. And if you want to go to hell, you're going to have to step right over him to get there. God put something in your way to keep you from going somewhere he doesn't want you to be. God don't want you to be in this place of darkness, uh, uh, separated from him. That's why Christ came was to bring us into relationship with him and to keep us from going places that he did not want us to to be in in the first place. Intentionally find a place to share Christ. You know that guy, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, I believe that guy's now a believer. I believe now, I believe he accepted Jesus, I believe. So he changed, so when he was intentional about it, see he waited for the right time. He never pushed it. He never was, you know, was, was being a burden to him. The one thing, you know, that I heard him say that I thought was so excellent was he said, the one thing you ought to do to people around you is you ought to, add value to them first. And when you add value to somebody, when you invest your time and you add value to somebody, then it begins to open up a door that allows you to intentionally share Christ with them when the time's right. Intentional. So we got to be intentional with our plan for generosity. Amen? How many of us are going to develop a plan this week? Anybody? Anybody? I believe, you know, and I, the thing is, I just want to encourage you to do this. That's the whole purpose of this is I want to encourage you, you know, stop and think about some ways that maybe you could be a little bit more generous in those areas we just talked about. Investing your time, you know, sharing Christ with somebody because you know what? I believe, you know, I've got friends in the workplace that I've never really talked about this thing with, but you know what? This week, maybe I'll look for a door to open that will allow me to intentionally share Christ. Maybe you've got some friends that you've built a relationship at work and maybe you'll look, maybe because of what we're talking about and maybe because of your plan for generosity, you'll begin to look for areas where you can intentionally share Christ with somebody. That's, that's the ultimate message. We want to share Christ with people. Amen? The second part I want to talk about is being moved with compassion. I, I touched on this a little bit last week. But what we want to do is, is and when we're beginning to be more intentional with our generosity, when we're looking uh, to develop this plan of how I can be generous, what we also want to do is be moved by compassion. You know, and I touched on it last week because Jesus, when he'd done a lot of stuff, uh, when he would heal people and when he would do things, it, it was often preceded by he was moved by compassion. He was moved by it and that's what caused him to do it. Mark chapter 1 verse 40 through 41 says this, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, here it is, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. You see that? You see that whole covenant operation there? The leper came to the source, the, the only source that could cleanse him. And he says, if you're willing, because guess what? There still has to be a willingness to do it. There still has to be a willingness in the heart. Amen? You still have to be willing to do these things. He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can change somebody's life. If you're willing you can help somebody get clean because you can introduce them to the one who can cleanse them. You can intentionally share Christ. See, it all comes back around to Christ. I got the definition here for compassion. It says compassion. It is an awareness of the misfortune of another accompanied with the action to relieve it. It is, what it's saying is it's, it's being aware of the people that are around you that may be going through tough situations, that may be struggling, that may be dealing with something and they don't know how to get through it. It says you're aware of that and then once you see it, it says there is something inside of you that causes up an action in you. It, it causes you to want to act 
on the misfortune or it causes you to want to act on what you're seeing people struggle with. Amen. And it wants you to act on it so that you can do what? Relieve it. God's people are generous and when we are aware of our surroundings and we're, when we become aware of the people who are hurting around us, how do you know that, if you, if you've ever had that happen to you, you've heard something about somebody or you know somebody or you've seen somebody that was hurting or going through something and just something inside of you just, man, I wish I could do something. You ever felt that way? Man, I wish I could, man, I wish I could help that person. Well, you can. You can help that person. You might not be able to help them in the way that you think you should, but you can help them because you can introduce them to Jesus. That's an, that's an opportunity to begin to talk about Jesus and to begin to talk about how he can bring you through a situation. Amen? Awareness and action. Aware. We've got to become aware of our surroundings, and then we got to begin to act on what's around us. You know, because sometimes we, we become aware of certain things, and what we also need to be aware of is what God is doing in our life. What has God called you to do? What is my purpose? I need to be aware of what God has placed around me. And when I see something, I need to act on it. You hear what I'm saying? Does that make sense? If I, if I begin to see that, hey, God, God you know what? I, I really have this passion and this desire to talk to and talk and reach to people. You know, I had somebody tell me last week, we were standing outside in the front foyer, and he said, you know, you was talking about purpose. He said, I really felt feel like my purpose is people. He said, like when I walk into the room, and this is just this is part of a person's personality. It's the part of the it's part of the way that God wired you. You know, everybody's hardwired a different kind of way, and, and you notice and you're aware of different kind of things. And this guy, he was aware when he walked into a room, he always found the people or the person that was always sitting off to the side by themselves. He said, I would always go and talk to that person. I would sit and I would get to know them and everything like that. He said, I just feel like that's my purpose. I feel like my purpose is is people. You hear what I'm saying? You have a purpose, and until you begin to fulfill it, until you become aware of what your purpose is, you can't act on it. But when you become aware of what your purpose is, you can act on it, and guess what? You'll begin to change people's lives. So there's three points of action that I want to talk about this morning. I got three points here, one, two, and three. I want to talk about these are action things that we could do. And the first one is see life through the lens of eternity. See life through the lens of eternity. You know, because we're blessed each day when we wake up. We're blessed each day when we wake up. And the, you know, the thing I try to say to myself, and, and of course, don't get me wrong, it don't always go like this. You know, you wake up, you want to do the good thing, you want to try the right thing, but sometimes... You know, the day's just too hard and you just, you know what I mean? You just didn't quite make it where you thought you was going to. But when I wake up, I want to say, you know what, God, you've given me another day. How can I impact this world? How can I impact the people around me for eternity? How can I impact them and change their life? You know, and I begin to think about this this term for eternity, and a lot of times it's been taught as this, you know, when, when you die, it's this eternal place outside of here. You know, it's this thing out there somewhere. And I begin to think about this when I begin to do a little bit of studying on this. And one of the Greek words for eternity, it actually means, it actually is, is in reference to a type of relationship. So it actually references a type of relationship. So when I begin to look at this, I'm like, you know what, see life through the lens of the type of relationship that I can bring people to. How can I bring somebody into a relationship with God today? That's the intentional sharing Christ with others. How can I bring somebody into that? Because guess what, when I bring them into it, because you know Jesus said that you would have eternal life. And actually what he meant by that was saying that you're going to have a certain type of relationship. You're going to have a certain type. You know, it, it wasn't like eternity, like you're going to have eternity, you know, the, the never ending, you know, no time outside of space and all that kind of thing. He was actually saying that you're going to have a relationship with God. You're going to have this uh, relational type of life because of what he's done, because of what he came to do. Amen. 
Matthew 6, 19 through 24, it says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eyes, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And a lot of times, you know, well, he's, he's dealing with this issue of money here, but a lot of times I think it's not just money. Sometimes we serve other things. Sometimes we find other things. Sometimes our eyes are not fixed on God and fixed on His plan and what He's called us to do. Our eyes are fixed on our will, our plan, what, we, what we're trying to accomplish in life and not what He's trying to accomplish in our life. Amen? We need to begin to look through the lens of relationship. And you know, I talked about the treasure when he's talking about storing up your treasure. Last week we talked about a little bit about that treasure. He's not talking about gold and, and so forth and so on. He's talking about people. So guess what? When I bring people, when I intentionally share Christ with somebody and I bring them into that relational life, what I've done is I've stored up a treasure for myself in heaven. I've, I have impacted the heavenly realm of things. I have brought heaven a little bit closer to the earth because I'm telling you, we have got to get really focused on bringing heaven into the earth. We really do. We got to get focused on it. There's so much stuff going around right now. People are still focused about getting themselves out of the earth and into heaven. And I'm telling you, like I, I had to, you know, normally I don't, I don't go on rants and I don't do this kind of stuff because I know that a lot of people are not willing and they're not ready to hear it yet. But yesterday, uh, you know, yesterday I, I had to, of course I let loose on Facebook, y'all know, and that's official. That's where everybody, you know, if you let it loose on Facebook, then you've really done something. But I had to, most of the time I keep quiet because I just know that, you know, some people are just not ready to hear it. God has not, you know, it says He will give them an ear to hear only when it's time. You know, He'll open up their hearts so that they can receive when it's time. But you can't do things outside of the time. And, and so yesterday, as you know, yesterday there was this whole thing going around. The world was supposed to end yesterday, so I'm glad all of you made it. So make sure you get your end time punch card. We'll have them out front. Make sure you stamp it on your way out. I want to say this is at least the third or fourth one I have survived. I'm on a roll. Some of you have been alive for much longer and you were around in 88 and all those other reasons. You know, I remember actually I, I looked at the book. I found the book one time and it was called 88 Reasons Why the World Was Going to End in 1988. You know, and then Y2K happened and it was supposed to be then. And, and then, you know, when all the 2001 stuff happened. And, and so guess what happened was all the hurricanes and the solar eclipse and all that happened. And they said, okay, September 23rd, that's it. That's it. But the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. But the year was 70 A.D. That's when it happened. Anyways, <laughs> I saw that on a Facebook post yesterday. I thought it was hilarious. But anyway, so here, here's what happens. Here's what happens when people live in fear. When, when people are focused on themselves getting out of fear as opposed to doing God's will, which Jesus said, I have come to do thy will. I've come to bring heaven into earth. Do thy will, O Lord. That's what he says. Do thy will. And he said, uh, you know, uh, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know why we can't grab a hold of that. God's not interested in us getting out of here to get to there. He's interested in inhabiting the place that He created. And He's interested in doing it through the people that He created. So when the people of God can come together and say, you know what, maybe I've missed something here. Maybe God's more, maybe God wants me to become more aware of how I can get Him into the earth and not how I can get myself out there. Okay? And when we can do that, because guess what today, they, what they did was, since it didn't happen yesterday, they said, oh, we misinterpreted some scientific facts and it's actually the 24th. 
And I was like, okay, so we missed it, so we moved it a day. So when it doesn't happen today, guess what we're going to do? Okay, we missed it again. I, I get, you know what, let's go back and look at this again. And what I, what, I, what I posted on there, you know, and I don't ever do these things to be argumentative because it is a divisive subject. I don't ever do it to be argumentative, but I do it because I want to challenge people's thinking that will maybe bring them to a place where they'll say, you know what, I have survived seven end times, seven catastrophes. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something. I, what I want to do is, is I don't want to anger people. I want people to think, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing a piece to this puzzle. Because guess what? When you get to the point where you're saying, I'm missing some pieces. Guess what? That's when, you know, somebody who has been given the revelation about those things can step in and set you free from a life of fear and bondage. And we can reveal the truth to you about those things. And so it's like I said last week, we're going to be doing a series, or I'm going to be doing a series soon called Decoded, and we're going to be going in-depth on the study of Matthew 24, which is where a lot of the end-time stuff comes from. Okay, so I, hopefully I can deal with some of this and reveal some of this stuff to you and to hopefully some of those that are watching us online. But I go back to say that we need to begin to see life through the lens of relationship, we need to begin to see life that God is more interested in bringing heaven to earth than He is bringing you to heaven. Because guess what? When you bring heaven into earth, you ain't got to worry about getting to heaven. You're going to be in heaven. When we become aware of it, when we become aware of our surroundings. Amen? So that's what we need to begin to do. Number two, generosity leads and heart follows. Generosity leads and heart follows. I want to show you what I mean by that. Matthew, what we just read through there, that one passage, Matthew 6, 21, says this, For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, wherever your generosity is, wherever you're investing in, wherever you're pouring yourself into, he says that's where your heart's going to be as, as well. So when you invest in to the people of God, when you invest into the one sheep that's left the 99, when you go after the one that's lost, when you begin to help those who are hurting, when you begin to invest your time into people that need it, and you begin to try to help them, and you begin to intentionally share Christ with people, guess what I'm doing? I'm storing up my treasure. I'm placing my treasure in people. And it says, wherever I place my treasure, that's where my heart's going to be also. And you know what? I really want my heart to be in the same place that God's heart is. When I, want, when I think about my heart, I need to look at myself and my heart from the perspective of, God, how do I get my heart where your heart is? And if you read the Bible, you will quickly find out that God's heart has always, always been on His people. Always. From the beginning of time, all the way through to the book of Revelation, His, book, his heart has always been focused on His people. Even when they turned, even when creation fell. You know, that's like I tell people all the time, y'all think, you really think that the Creator of all things didn't know that this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. His heart was so fixed on people that the, that the first good portion of the Bible is a redemptive story about redeeming His bride, which is you, about redeeming His people. His heart's in His people. And you know, we're still in the business of redemption. We're still in the business of, of being ambassadors of God. That's what Paul said. He said, you're an ambassador of God in the earth. You're the one who goes and shares that message with them that leads them to redemption. It's the goodness of God that draws all men unto Himself, that draws men to repentance. And all repentance means, it means that you've changed your way of thinking means you've changed your mind about some things. You, you begin to realize that, hey, maybe this isn't the life that I want to live. Maybe this life that somebody's introducing to me because they intentionally shared Christ with me, maybe that's the life I really feel like I want to live. Amen? Matthew 9, 35 through 36, it says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of what? 
of the kingdom. It's still what we're supposed to be preaching today. God, what Jesus was doing was He was preaching, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What He was preaching was, God's kingdom is coming. His kingdom is not of this world, but this world is going to be of His kingdom before it's all said and done. That's what he got. That's the whole message that Jesus was, was teaching. And it said that He was teaching the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Did you know that we're still supposed to be doing that? Did you know that the gifts of the Holy Spirit that was given to us are still supposed to be in action today? We're still supposed to preach the kingdom. We're still supposed to let people know, stop, stop looking to leave here and start, start looking to get there what you think is there here. You hear what I'm saying? Stop looking out there and you know what? You've got a sickness, I can help you. I, I just so happen to be the ambassador of a king over the greatest government I've ever seen in my life, and he is so generous that he is giving me the abilities to heal you of your sickness. That's what it means to be an ambassador. An ambassador means that you represent the one that's in leadership. So guess what? If we have like we have ambassadors of United States, and when our ambassadors go into a foreign country and they're on their, you know, they'll have like their own little house and stuff. Well, guess what? Where they are and that house and all of that land, guess what? Even though it's in a foreign country, it belongs to the United States. I hope y'all can hear this. Because, you know, a lot of people say this, well, you're a stranger, you're a, you're a foreigner in the land. Well, you know what I want to say? I want to say, yeah, but I'm also an ambassador. So wherever I step, guess what? This, this, this land that I'm standing in belongs to the one that I represent, which is God. I represent God everywhere that I go, everywhere that I step, even though I might be in a foreign land, even though I might be surrounded by a lot of things that are not operating inside the will of God, even though I might be surrounded by a lot of enemies, I'm still an ambassador of God and where I'm standing belongs to Him. And guess what? If I ever get in trouble, because it, technically how this is supposed to work, that if we have an ambassador for the United States that's in another country and that, that where they are becomes under siege by foreign enemies, the U.S. is supposed to go in and retrieve their people out of that out of that zone. So what I want to say to you is that when you feel like you're surrounded by enemies, you just need to remember that I'm an ambassador. And though you're going to try to come against me, God's going to send something to me. God's going to send some angels to me. He's going to send some people to me that's going to protect me and is going to keep me safe. I'm an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. I represent Him in this earth. The minute that we can get that in our head, that we are representing God and everywhere that we step, we are claiming the kingdom in that area. Even though it's foreign land, every time I take a step, I'm claiming that land for the kingdom of God. Amen? Got me about to preach up in here. Number three, this is the last one. This is an important one. You need to experience God's love for myself. Experience God's love for yourself. Because you know, before you can go out and before you can go out and tell people all about God's love, you need to know what it feels like yourself. You need to know that when you don't feel like you when you feel like you can't love yourself, that God's love is more than enough. You need to know that when you don't feel like you're qualified, when you feel like you're not good enough, that God's love is more than enough for me. I need to experience God's love for myself before I can truly share it with somebody else. You know the reason Paul was so successful and like, you know, nine-tenths of the New Testament was written by Paul? A big majority of it. You know why he was so successful at what he did? Because he experienced God's love firsthand. He had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And, and you know, and I, I tell this story, you know, but I think it is amazing that God picked a na man named Ananias and sent him down there because it, the name means grace. And so God sent grace to Paul when he still couldn't see. And grace showed up and said, open your eyes. Jesus said that I come as grace and as truth. And I'm the ambassador of that. I represent that. 
And so when I have experienced it, when I've experienced the love, the grace, and the truth of God for myself, I can, I can, I can perfectly represent it because I know what it means to be loved by Him. I can be passionate about it because it changed my life. I can be, you know, I can be so filled with the Holy Spirit because, you know, I had scales on my eyes and I could not really see the world around me. And then one day grace showed up and grace said, open your eyes. And I was able to see God's will for me in my life. And from that day forward, I followed nothing else but the will of God. I'd done nothing else but share Christ. That's exactly, if you look at Paul's story, that's exactly what happened to him. He was caught up in religion, which were scales on his eyes. But when grace come and showed him that I'm not about religion, I'm about love. I'm about relationship. I'm about getting, I'm not about getting people into religion, I'm about getting people into life. See, Jesus, and, and, and sometimes it kind of bothers me that people, you know, people when they say Christianity is a religion. Because Christianity was never meant to be a religion. Christianity was always meant to be about a lifestyle. It was always meant to be about life and experiencing life. People were tired of experiencing religion. People today are still tired of experiencing religion. We are ambassadors of Christ. And if we can approach people we can develop a plan for generosity. I can develop a plan for how I'm going to reach people with this good news message. I can be the embodiment of grace that says, open your eyes. God wants a relationship with you. He don't want you to experience religion. Luke 7, 47 says this. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who... He who uh, has been forgiven little, loves little. You know, and I, I've talked about this once before. Forgiveness and love have to go hand in hand. Sometimes you'll never be able to love somebody till you forgive yourself. That's the biggest thing people have a problem with. They cannot forgive themselves, so therefore they cannot move on. When you begin to forgive yourself and you begin to let go of the past and all of the things that happened back here, God can move you forward in love. Amen? Because Jesus, John actually said this, John said this in 1 John 4, 19, he says this, he said, we love. Because why? Because He first loved us. That's the only reason. God is love. The only way that I can love is when I forgive myself, when I forgive what I've done back here, when I let go of those things and I allow God's love to fill me up and I begin to experience grace and truth about who I really am in Christ, then I can move forward in love because I realize God doesn't care about all the wrong things I've done. All God cares about is if we have a relationship, if we are connected. And if we're connected, because, you know, even if you were to look, even if, and people still have this idea, but even if you were to look at all the things that you've done wrong as sin, if you were to say, man, I did that and that was a sin, and I did that, that was a sin, I did this, that was a sin. Even if you're one of those people that do that, I want to encourage you because God said this in Hebrews. He said, they'll be my people, and I will remember their sins no more. So even if you think that all the wrong things you've done are considered sins, be encouraged today because God's not focused on what you have done in your past. He said, I'll remember that stuff no more. All I care about is getting you in here. All I care about is holding you in my arms. All I care about is loving you and using you to share my love with others around you. Amen? God doesn't only want to change you. He wants to change others through you. So don't just think about what God can do for me. Think about what God can do through me. Amen? Stand on your feet.